when I'm learning to be more patient, my family benefits. Yeah. When I learn to control my anger, other people around me benefit. When I learn to be generous, people benefit from that. Yeah. I get better. Who cares how good you are? In Christ, I'm perfect. Yeah. I can't get any better. Dr. Beerman, thank you for sitting with me. This is a full circle moment. Um, I feel like I owe you so much gratitude because when I was on campus, I don't think at the time the curriculum included the sort of um, reformational contrast between the reformed and, and confessional Lutheran thought. So I got literally everything from you as it related to contrasting those two expressions of the Reformation. Yeah. And I was a staunch five point Calvinist at the time. <laughs> Which and, I didn't know. <laughs> which was perfect. <laughs> which was perfect. Because uh, not that you would have changed, but you were so authentically yourself. And it was so confronting in a helpful way because I had never thought about the origins of the Reformation in a serious way. Yeah. Because in my world, we received um, the bondage of the will from Luther. Yeah. And then after that, John Calvin sort of saves Christianity, that kind of narrative. <laughs> right. And uh, but no, so thank you. I'm I'm, I'm like literally feel like I'm forever in your debt, so to speak, just in terms of uh, the way the Lord used you to serve me and, and by extension, so many others that are. Well, just... it's God's truth that does it, Mark, because I was just the guy voicing it. So, but I, it would, it's always gives me a great deal of joy to hear you re reference those times in your life. It's, yeah. it's, it's great. Ooh. So <laughs> since then, it's just been a fun journey of uh, helping people sort of move into the simplicity of scripture and yeah. the gospel and uh, sort of walking back to the origins of the Reformation and helping sort of break up some of the misconceptions there. So maybe if, firstly, you could speak to um, just sort of the heart behind the Reformation. It wasn't yeah. this divisive thing. And, right. You know, it, was, it wasn't that at all. No, it was never the, the, the plan at all. Luther is simply this <clears throat> really serious monk who is serious about trying to be right with God, mm -hmm. working through scriptures, and he realizes, whoa, what's in the Bible here in Romans is actually a whole new way of thinking about things that God's righteousness is not something I have to earn, yeah. but something God gives to me. His mind was just blown wide open yeah. and everything changed. And so then he's all excited like, well, I got to tell everybody. Yeah. And maybe naively, he thinks everybody's going to be so excited to hear this. And he finds out that, well, no, not exactly. Yeah. Because the whole Roman Curia had built this beautiful system beautiful in their mind, um, these wrong understandings. And so Luther got all this pushback. But see, the whole point of the Reformation then is simply Luther's desire to teach and to hold on to God's one truth, which the church has always held on to. Mm -hmm. And he was simply doing a correction, trying to bring the church back to what it had always taught. So Luther's not coming up with new ideas, mm -hmm. new thoughts, a new variation. He's just saying, let's teach what the apostles taught. Let's teach what scripture teaches. Let's teach what the church has always taught. Yeah. And that's what we need to do. Yeah. So he had no intention of starting another church. Yeah. That's so interesting too, because it seems like once everything sort of hits the fan and then it goes from the thing you just described with Luther and it moves to Zwingli and the Anabaptists, that the shift happens and uh, mm -hmm. sort of focus in terms of Christianity, and then Calvin gets a hold of it. And uh, so can you describe a bit of, of maybe that shift or what was lost yeah. in that shift? Well, I see, there's always been a, a, a realistic component of Christianity, which it, it's, it's personal. You, exp you live it. Mm -hmm. you, you are killed and you are made alive. The, mm -hmm. the law kills, the gospel makes you alive. It happens to you. And we don't want to leave that out. So it's always utterly personal. And yet there is this tension then between truth and what's right, you know, and just out there and doesn't involve me and it doesn't, you know, the whole extra nose thing. Yeah. It's there. That's right as well. But see, you can't play them off against each other. They both belong together. And the problem is when things get too sterile and too much just getting all the rules right, getting all the everything lined up, there's a tendency to kind of becomes not very real and people don't live it. So then there's the counteraction of, hey, we got to make this more real and, you know, the living faith. And then you start to kind of diminish the doctrine. The challenge is keeping both of these things together. Mm -hmm. Roman, the Roman Catholic, Roman Catholic Church of Luther's time was over the top, this system, and it was just this play the game and do the things right, and where your heart was it didn't matter. Living the faith didn't matter. As long as you went to Mass, said your, did, your, did the requirements, you know, everything was fine. You went 
It, I went and saw these relics. I made a pilgrimage. Everything's fine. Where your heart is didn't matter. So part of the correction was, no, your heart does matter. But see, then there's the overcorrection. Mm -hmm. And then, so this wingly starts doing the overcorrection. It's all that matters is your heart. And you better have the right heart. You better be sincere. And that creates a whole other pile of problems. Yeah. Am I sincere enough? Is my heart in it enough? Mm -hmm. And this is where this tension's always been. And, and this goes way back in the early church, too. You already see this kind of tension there between truly living it and really being genuine and then having things you know, right and the doctrine right. You got to keep both of these things together. Yeah. Um, so that's part of the history of this is this mm. overcorrection of against the scholastic cerebral into a more lived, heartfelt. And when you pit those against each other, you're in trouble. Yeah. You've got to hold them together. Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting because that imbalance seems like it's, it made its way to the Americas. Absolutely. And, and, and see, then there's a whole other thing that adds in here to make things even worse. Yeah. So you got this kind of back and forth, back and forth. And this is the case with German pietism. You know, you got, oh, we're being too scholastic again in the 1700s. We got to go back to more of a pious way. So there's this first big wave of German Lutheran pietism, guys like Spanier and Franca and stuff. Yeah. And they're trying to get things more heartfelt. That's going on. But now when we come to the, the American context, there's another element that starts adding into all this, and that becomes the huge influence of the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And the Enlightenment has such a negative impact on all of this because it makes the scholastic stuff even more cerebral, and it makes the pietistic stuff even more pious because it's all becoming inwardly focused. Mm -hmm. It's on me and what I discover, what I know, what I feel, what I experience. And that's kind of the real heart of what we would call the American pietism. It becomes coupled up with this enlightenment emphasis, and now it becomes far more important than being part of a community and part of the church is me and my walk with Jesus, me and my relationship, my personal relationship. And all that kind of language, it's not in the Bible. It becomes standard in our American way of thinking, and so it becomes highly personalized instead of much more corporate, the way the church has always operated. Yeah. Woo. Man, that's so interesting, too, because it almost seems like there's no way back. But we know, obviously, the Spirit of God can reverse things. Yeah. But where would you start in terms of helping a person understand and first see these yeah. things and then begin to trust in yeah. ancient Christianity? And in a, I, you like that phrase, yeah, ancient dude. Christianity, and I'm with you on that. It, you know, because to me, the ancient Christianity is today's Christianity. Mm. It's the same all the way through. It's yeah. God's teaching. It's this, this regular fide, you know, the rule of faith that's just been there, guiding and directing. And it's the same stuff that Paul taught, mm -hmm. the same stuff that Luther taught, the same stuff we're teaching. Mm -hmm. And so, in a very real sense, we don't ever want to go back. Mm. What we want to do is move forward, but move forward in that truth. Ooh. And so, so we press forward. So now we're living in a very individualistic country of America with all this enlightened influence. What do we do? What we do is we help people remember you know, there's more to life than just going solo. Okay. It is being born into a community, being baptized into a community. And now you're part of this community of faith that shows you who you are, yeah. teaches you where, you're, where you fit, and you begin to see, oh, so this heartfelt Christian walk it's not about me getting right with God. It's about me being what God created me to be yeah. in relationship with other people. Yeah. And it's very real. It's very lived, but it's being guided and directed by things outside of you, mm -hmm. by forces that are put in there by the church and that God are God-directed. That's where the real meat comes in and the real yeah. strength comes in. That's good. So how do you tie the sacraments into that? So for an expression of Christianity, it says we can have what you just described, but we don't see a place for the sort of mystical union taking place in the sacraments. That's, that seems like a, an unnecessary barrier to... Get. Yeah, well, see, the sacramental life is the core of all this because the sacramental life is God's way of being present and God's way of then delivering grace and also binding us together. Yeah. We all do the sacraments together. Yeah. We, we celebrate communion at the rail together, and there's a communion with God, the vertical, but there's also a horizontal communion with each other. We're, we're sharing this life together, and it binds us together. And in baptism, we all had that same death and birth to new life in baptism. We're all bound in that commonality of sinners who have been made alive in Christ. It's our identity. We all bear the name of Christ. And so the sacraments actually bring us together in community and become the, the, the source, the lifeblood of the very, the very direction and definition of what the church is. Mm -hmm. So sacraments are never an add-on. Yeah. They're the heart. They're the core. Yeah, and it's so interesting, too, because I was watching a sermon just randomly in a yeah. hotel room, and um, 
So the guy is setting up this sermon to be a, a useful thing for people to have joy during the holiday season, yeah. right? So he goes through like a seven step thing to, to have joy. Uh -huh. And it was so interesting because the way he sort of worked Christianity out was almost like you didn't need Christ per se. He just had these sort of cool ways based on some pithy truths, some proverbs yeah. to really access your uh, true identity in yeah, Christ yeah, yeah. sort of thing. But I think it's interesting that in confessional Lutheran thought, we understand that uh, all of life is repentance. We're always living our baptism. And in that way, we always need Christ. Absolutely. But if you have this other expression of Christianity where you kind of just need to be a better person. Right. It was like, do you need Christ, really? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus is not your ticket to get started. There, now I can move on and take care of myself. No, he, he's your life all the way through. Yeah. Everything is always dependent upon him. And as you pointed out, when we're living the Christian life, striving to become more faithful and following, better servant, better caring, we should be doing all that stuff. Yeah. But when we're doing that stuff, what we become aware of is we're not getting there. Yeah. We're always falling short. And so there's always the need for the forgiveness that comes in Christ, mm -hmm. the, the renewal that comes in him, the, the, yes, I make things new again, and you are forgiven, yeah. and we desperately need that. Yeah. And so you're right. A good measure of a, of a great sermon is, is Christ essential, or does he become kind of an add-on? Yeah. And if he's an add-on, something's fishy. Yeah. So, all right, so from, you know, just your, your, your seat in life and how mm -hmm. you have worked through these things, um, where would you point someone that's interested in um, the confessions? Uh -huh. So where would you point them in the Book of Concord, perhaps, to say, yeah. jump in here and, 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 and sort of test it? Yeah, a great place to start in the confessions. If, you, if you're not familiar with the confessions, what's it mean to be confessional? You need to get a start. So just start with the very beginning. Mm -hmm. First thing you're going to see, Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, Athanasian Creed. Pretty fundamental, these yes. basic creeds. Okay, that helps. Well, then just start reading through the Augsburg Confession. Mm -hmm. And if you read the first 21 articles, and it's not that long, yeah. you get the core parts of the Christian faith, what God has done for us in Christ, where the sacraments fit, what it means to be living in the Christian church together. It's all right there. Yeah. And it becomes very central. Now, if you get through that and thinking, this is great, where do I go next? Jump to the small called articles and mm -hmm. let Luther kind of walk you through there. Then you got the large catechism. Killer yeah. stuff. That's, yeah. That's great. Woo. No, that's good, too, because I know, you know, so some people are struggling with, in their minds, confessional Lutheran thought is a, it's a novel idea. Yeah, right. And, and they're experiencing it as something yeah. that's new and that sort of competes with what they would probably say is the simplicity of faith. Because I think they have Christianity sort of framed where you become a Christian and then you go out and live your purpose in life. That's right. That kind of thing. You, you bet. Yeah, but it's like, so, so trying to help people understand this is how Christianity has functioned by and large since its inception. And after the New Testament, I mean, you just have this sort of liturgical style, life, uh -huh. divine service, and when the Christians gathered. Um, so how do you sort of normalize that as you engage mm -hmm. people that are not, ex you know, exposed to this world? Like, where do yeah. you start in conversation yeah, I'll start with um, what it means to be called into Christ. That mm. The fact that he's the one who makes the move. He's, we don't go looking for him. We don't make decisions. He calls us in. Mm -hmm. When Christ calls you, you say yes. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you that gift to see you say yes and you receive what he gives. And away you go. Mm -hmm. And now it's a matter of just following. Mm -hmm. um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer just comes to mind here. Mm -hmm. I've been teaching him, emphasizing him even more than when you were a student. Okay. Yeah. Um, and he, he just gets this. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Mm -hmm. This is a classic line from Cost of, Cost of Discipleship. And this is the point. We, we just follow Christ. And what Christ leads us into is a life more and more focused on serving the other, receiving all that God gives, and then sh sharing that with those around us. This is, this is the heart of Luther's doctrine as well. Yeah. God gives us everything in Christ. Now we live our lives out for others. That's what confessionalism is all about. Yeah. It's about receiving and then giving and doing it in the context of the church that teaches and guides and directs. So it's not just me doing a Lone Ranger Christianity kind of a thing. Yeah. Okay, good. So how would you help someone track that down? So yeah. they're listening to a sermon yeah. or they're having conversation with another Christian. Mm -hmm. How do you help them in their sort of spiritual ear yeah. to discern when they're, when they're leaving a healthy version or an expression yep. of Christianity to this other thing? What things are you listening for? Right. Well, they should be asking for, 
is the, is the creed being central? Is the, is the word of God that God has given to us, is this central? Or is this more about my interpretation of a text and human trying to figure things out? Is the creed the central driving thing? What role does the, um, the authority of the church have, you know, the, the corporate church? Is the church, church is teaching, directing this, or is it more this a novel idea, a new insight? New insights are helpful, but you have to be careful. Yeah. Is this in sync with what has been given to us? And then, so, and the kind of coupled with that is that strong corporate dimension. Is this about me sorting things out so that I become a better person, so that I'm doing something more the way I think I should, or am I hearing from the church and being part of a broader community? What role do I have to help those in this congregation where I'm a member? And if it ever leads you away from a congregation, you know you're in deep trouble yeah. because the church always brings us into community. I'm part of this community. I'm part of this faithful group. We gather together. I have commitments to them. They have commitments to me. That's a critical part. So when you hear sermons that are talking a lot about you and your relationship are leading you away from the corporate community, are leading you away from the certainty of God's grace coming to you from outside, and instead of encouraging you to look into your heart to find things, you're in serious trouble. Then. Mm. Those are things to be looking for. Ooh, that's good, too, because there is this notion that, uh, and recently people have been hitting me up saying that they get these things on their own, that they don't have to gather with the saints and they sort of have this sort of confidence in a devotional life where they yeah. feel fulfilled, they feel yeah. that kind of thing. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, if, if Christianity is what you describe, then that other thing is not, you know? That's right. <laughs> no, that's right. And you see, what I have often tried to tell people as well is going to church is not about what you get out of it, what you need. Yeah. It's your responsibility. Yeah. People need you to be there and you need to be part of that. And so your, your, this idea that, Church is there, I don't really need it. You're missing the whole point. Church is not there to help you to get to some goal you have. Church is your reason for being. I'm here to be part of this community. And so I have gifts and skills and abilities that are at work here in this community for the sake of these people so that this community can be faithful so then we can make a better witness to the world around us. That's where you do it. Yeah. It's not a it's not a one on one thing. Yeah. You and you are going out and doing your own thing alone. Yeah. Ooh. So how, so how is it that sort of, um, I guess, um, generic American evangelicalism sort of won the day? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting story. Those people, are, some church historians have done work on this and thought about this stuff, and they'll tell you the story in all of its gory detail. Yeah. But the, the bottom line, of, in my opinion, kind of boils down to is this sort of hyper-individualism, mm. which became wired into the American way of operating. We haven't shaken that. Yeah. You know, still, even today, I would say even more than ever, the, the individual is pretty much God in America. Yeah. It's the most important thing. Individual. No one can step on my rights, yeah. my self-expression, what I want. Be what you want. Do your own thing. Choose your own reality. You be you. I mean, all the cliches, all the movies, everything is always about self-authentic expression. Yeah. And so individualism is the driver in America and has been since its inception. And you couple that with Christianity, then what you get is an individualized Christianity, which is self-focused about me being what I should be, me and my relationship with God, me and my relationship with Jesus. And it's all about self, 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 self. Mm -hmm. And so then you don't really need a church. Yeah. Creeds, oh, that's somebody else imposing something on me. Yeah. I'll figure it out for myself. I'm going to read the Bible and decide what I think. I'm going to feel, I feel this. I think this. You know, my response is, who cares what you feel or what you think? What matters is what Christ says, what the church says. So anyway, you end up leaving creeds behind. You leave the church behind. Who needs a pastor? Pastor's just a dude. He's just giving me his opinion. I've got my own opinions. What does he matter? And a lot of pastors even play into this. I'm here to give you some encouragement. I'm your cheerleader. You know, let's go do this. You, I'll help you along the way. No, the pastor is supposed to be the authoritative voice of God saying, thus saith the Lord, listen. But if I'm doing my own thing, I don't want that. I don't need that. Yeah. Ooh, I love that. And it's important, too, to think about this because I've seen also where the local church from the pulpit also becomes this space where you can almost say sort of anything that seems to be moral or upright, and it's a different messaging. Yeah. And then people have this unrealistic expectation of the church as a whole where they'll say, why hasn't the church taught us about financial literacy or... <laughs> generational wealth or in all these <laughs> other causes because there's no scriptural basis for what the church is or how we ought to understand the nature of the word of God and yeah. the pulpit. Yeah. So can you speak to that a little bit just in terms of 
what the church is and what we should expect yeah. as church goers, church right. members, yeah. that whole thing. Yeah, the, the church is not an um, uh, institution to help you become better. Yeah. The church is not here to serve you. It's not a service organization. Mm-hmm. It's not that. Yeah. People assume that. It's a service. It's here to help. No. The church is, the most graphic way to put it scripturally is, the church is the body of Christ. Yeah. It's the presence of Christ in the world. And then, of course, in the book of Revelation, it is the church is the bride of Christ. Yeah. You know, Christ's precious bride. And so the church is the place where God is at work. Yeah. Um, Bonhoeffer puts this nicely. He talks about the church being the witness to the reality of Christ in the world. Mm-hmm. So the church is here to show the world what it looks like to live in God's reality. And so we do that by living a life together. We do that by the way we worship, receiving from God, caring for others. And then, yeah, trying to make a difference in the world around us, mm-hmm. helping those who are marginalized or being hurt or being suffered from injustice. Mm-hmm. We do intervene for the sake of what's right, yeah. but we do it because this is what God would have us do, not because it makes us feel better or because somebody's rights are being infringed upon and we don't believe that's right as Americans. No, we care for people because God put us here to care for them. Yeah. And so the church becomes the, the presence of God in the world, the, the actual body of Christ in the world, making his reality spread further into the world. Yeah. That's what we're here for. Yeah. Ooh, a last thing. I would love to just hear you help us understand the, the usefulness of ethics and, and, and being pious, being a good yeah, Christian, yeah, yeah. not for the sake of you know, getting extra credit before God, but the usefulness of us sort of taking the Spirit's work and, and letting it be moved throughout our mm-hmm. everyday experience. Can you sort of help us understand what God is getting at with that? Not to just make us these moral beings like he's just yeah. so into morality, but it right. seems like there's something else in his heart for it. Oh, huge. Yeah. And this, this is exactly right. Trying to strive for moral um, growth or a more pious life or more pure way of living is good, yeah. but not so that you achieve some standard so that look what I've accomplished or look how much God's going to love me or look how much better I am. This is never the point. If that's what's driving you, you're, you haven't even started. You're, you, you have to go back to square one where you die to yourself. The whole point of growing in moral um, ability or in you know, gr- becoming more pious in my living, more upright, more faithful in following God's commandments. The whole point in that is not so that I get better. The whole point is so that I better serve those around me. Mm. When I'm doing what God calls me to do, those around me benefit. Yeah. When I'm learning to be more patient, my family benefits. Yeah. When I learn to control my anger, other people around me benefit. When I learn to be generous, people benefit from that. Yeah. I get better. Who cares how good you are? Yeah. In Christ, I'm perfect. Yeah. I can't get any better. So I'm not striving for moral growth for my own sake. I'm doing it for the sake of those around me. And this is Luther captures this really nicely in an essay early in his career from 1520 called The Freedom of the Christian. And he says in there that the Christian lives outside of himself. He lives in faith toward God and in love toward his neighbor. In faith, he goes beyond himself up and receives everything from God. But then in love, he descends beneath himself and serves his neighbor. And so it's never about me. The focus is never on me, what I'm doing, how good I am, how bad I am, what I'm accomplishing. If you're you're navel-gazing and looking at yourself and your own performance, your eyes are in the wrong place. Instead, you should be looking around at your neighbor. What's my neighbor need? What's my neighbor benefiting? What, what What can I do? And when you're serving your neighbor, that's where your focus is. And you get better at serving your neighbor by following God's commands. Yeah. Ooh, beautiful. My goodness. We could talk all day on these matters. I That's so, so important. <laughs> but no, thank you for the time. I think this is um, this is the core you struck at that I, where people can connect dots and uh, yeah. and and not see these things to a thing to be resisted. Right. And there's, there's a simplicity here that uh, the guy was after, and really, yeah, just the reconciliation with himself bring these things. So, Amen. Yeah. Thank you for your time, Doctor Beerman. Yeah, my pleasure, Marcus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>